Are you recording, Kim? All right, let's jump in. Um, good morning, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to our Qualtrics Corner webinar. This is the first one we've done um, since our summer break. So we're back to the academic year, back to Qualtrics Corner every month. Uh, my name is Heather Lansky, and I am Manager of Data Quality Reporting for the EHE Office of Research. I'm also a Qualtrics Division Administrator for EHE. Um, so I, I've done a few of these webinars, and today's topic is embedded data. Kim Lytle is on with us, and she will moderate the chat window, which will allow me to, to get your questions um, and try to get those answered as we go along. If you have dual monitors, it would be great if you logged in to Qualtrics and followed along. If you not, if you don't, that's okay too. Um, if you have audio enabled, you can just um, shout out a question. If you don't, you can type it into the chat window, and Kim will pass it on to me. So let's get started. Um, we do several of these a year. Uh, any of our past workshops are archived on our website. You can jump in there at any time and, and review these videos as well as some other videos that we have of interest to researchers. So embedded data. Um, embedded data is really any extra information that you want to record into your data set um, in addition to the question responses that you're gathering from your survey. It can store information like what social media somebody um, came from, the condition that a respondent was assigned to in a research study, or previously gathered information that you may have about a participant, like their title or their their department. We I use it a lot here internally in the Office of Research, and I have mailing lists where I have folks' title and the department that they're in, and maybe some extra information that I might want to pull into my survey. So your embedded data consists of two parts. It's a field and a value. The field is the name that you give to your variable. Just like you would name a variable on a survey, you're going to name your variable in your embedded data. And the value is what that field is going to be um, related to your data set. So just like one, um, one question could have multiple answers, your embedded data field can have multiple values as well. So you might have a embedded data field called status, which would record whether the um, participant had screened out or whether they became a study candidate. So we'll get into that a little bit deeper as we go along. There's a number of different ways and places that you can use embedded data, and we will walk through uh, most of these in, in a use case scenario. Um, you can pipe it in to a survey question. You can use it in branch logic. You can use it in display logic. Um, you can use it in quotas, email triggers, contact list triggers, and Salesforce integration. I'm not going to go into Salesforce integration because that's that's not something that's, I don't think, wild, widely in play on campus, um, but just be aware that that's something that is possible. Um, some of these, depending on where you're at in your Qualtrics experience, some of these items may not be familiar to you. You may not know quotas. You may not know um, email triggers. That's OK. Um, there are videos on the Qualtrics um, University that you can look up and watch. I've also done some of these in the past and will continue to do some in the future. So keep your eyes out for those. Um, this segment doesn't really get into the details of those, but it does give you a little sh a little show of how it's set up, how embedded data is set up within each one of those categories. So you'll, you'll get a little taste of it um, as we go along. So the two places that you can set your embedded data, one is in, in a contact list. I'm getting a lot of feedback all of a sudden. Um, the second place is as part of a survey flow. And again, if you don't really understand what survey flow is, that that's okay. Um, there is a um, there is a video on that archive that talks about survey flow and and how survey flow is used. Um, so if you're going to do it from a contact list, so the easiest way to use a contact list, and the, and the main reason that you would use one is that you already have a list of contacts that exists somewhere outside of Qualtrics. You've got it in an Excel file. You've got it in, you know. A, Access database or some other place where you've got a list of the of the people that you want to send your survey to, so you can easily import that list into Qualtrics as a contact list. Um, and what that looks like is is this top portion here. Um, you have a, a a set of 
fields that are set by Qualtrics. These are the fields that have to have um, in this order. So you've got your first name, your last name, your email. Um, external data reference is some kind of an internal um, thing that, that Qualtrics has to have its own, but that column has to be there in that order. And then anything that follows external data reference is your embedded data. So any columns that you have out there to the right, those are, are what you're setting as your embedded data. And you would give that column a name, and then anything that follows under that column would be the embedded data for the person of that row. If you're doing it as a manual manual entry into your um, contact list, say you've already uploaded a, a larger list and you need to add a name or two, and you're going to do that manually, um, the way that you do that would be down here where we're in the Add Contacts function and there's an Add Manually button. And you see those same fields, they're in a little bit different order, which I, I don't necessarily understand, but email comes first on this one, um, and then first name and last name, that same external data reference that you leave blank, you can leave language blank. And then there's this uh, green plus sign out to the right here, and if you click that, it gives you this embedded data A column, and you can just keep clicking that and adding more columns as you go. And if you click into this box, then you can rename that column just like you would rename a column in Excel. You just double click in that, give your column a name, and it works the same way just as, as uploading the CSV file with your contact information in, in it looks like. If you're going to set embedded data in the survey flow, you get into the survey flow and then you start your branch and you add embedded data. So you've, you've, we've started a branch here. What is your age? 15 to 19. That's, that's our branch condition. And now we're going to add some embedded data onto that. So you click embedded data and then you get this set embedded data dialog box. So the first thing you do is give your um, embedded data a name. This is the field name that we had talked about. And then you set a value. Now you can set that value from the panel or the um, contact list that you already uploaded if you've got that there. Or you can set it, set an entirely new value of your own. And that's, that's what this example is showing is for anybody that falls into the age category of 15 to 19, we're going to set that embedded data category to be age category equals teenager. And this is where you would set up um, your research um, control, which, which arm of the research they're in. If, if they were a control, whether they were the experiment group, um, you know, what different groups folks fell into. Or the same thing with an opt-out or a, or a screen-in um, type of thing. You could, you could set up your, your screening criteria and then say, you know, if, if question 2, 6, and 12 are this way, then they're screened out. Um, and you could set your embedded data to be to be screened out if that's what you wanted to do. So that's a quick how to how to get there. And now let's talk a couple things about what kinds of scenarios you would use embedded data for. So these are our use cases. So the first one would be piped text. You're going to pipe your embedded data into the text of a question. So this is an example of a of a um, survey that I have personally used embedded data for, we are asking our researchers about, about research that they do in Ohio schools. And we've collected this data from them previously, so we have a, a data file of researchers, their names, their research um, topic, all kinds of different information, but it also contains where they're doing their research, which schools they're doing their research in. So in the next iteration of our survey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pipe in that embedded data that I already know about my researchers. I already know that this researcher does research in Hilliard City Schools and in Missoula County Schools, so I'm piping that data in to give them a list to refer to. So I'm going to say, here's the schools that you told us you do research in. Now answer the following questions about um, those schools. So as you'll see here, I've got, I've got 14 um, possible embedded data fields. That was the max of one of our researchers is in 14 different schools. So I've got an embedded data field for each one of those school districts. And um, it, the list will just build. If people have two, then it'll show two. If they have all 14, then all 14 will be there. And that's just piped in. This particular example is just piped into the, um, to the, the, the descriptive text question type of the survey. Another place you can put it is in the branch logic, which again is in your survey flow. So in this scenario, we're going to send our two different categories down different branches in the survey. So this is, would be what we would do if you had a, um, a screen out versus a study candidate branch. Um, you could send them down different paths of the survey. 
or if you had an experiment and a control, you could send them down different paths of the survey. Um, so you have the the um, embedded data that I have set up here is back to what we had seen before, where we've got 15 to 19 age categories set to teenager, 20 to 24 we've we've chosen to name those young adults. So we can set up these branches so that this teenager group will get a different set of questions and the young adults will get a different set of questions. So we've used branching logic combined with our embedded data to set that up. Okay. Yeah? I am having a really hard time hearing you. What? I, I can't hear you. Um, I don't see the question on my screen. Um, let me see if I can. Hang on a second. Let me see if I can get the box up. There are less than 14 school districts. Does Qualtrics remove the extra line rank automatically? No, it does not, unfortunately. Um, if you had there, there's space there for those 14. So there will be 14 line breaks there. Um, and the way that I've set this one up is it's in it's in. It's, it's its own question, like a preview question. So then on the next page was when the other things will start um, to get around that kind of funky looking um, line breaks. And I, I wish there was a way to, to do that, but at this point I haven't figured that out. Um, I tried it with commas first, but then I had a bunch of extraneous commas in there too. So I figured line breaks was the lesser of the two evils on that. Okay. Heather, this is Kim again. Can you hear me now? Yes, now I can hear you. <laughs> oh, good. Finally. Everyone else should also have their microphones turned on if they have a microphone. If not, um, I will just keep watching the chat box and I will get these questions to Heather as they come up. Okay, so using display logic with your embedded data is similar to your branch logic and and I, I won't get, go back into what the differences are that's that's covered in my um, partially in my in my survey flow webinar um, but display logic is actually within the survey itself so actually now I'm I've got to, okay yeah so my in my survey flow data um, that's where I've set my embedded data I've set in this particular example I've set um, people that have said that they like apples I have set them to be in the fruit group apple eaters um, so then now I can in my questions I can refer back to that group and say if fruit group is equal to apple eaters now I'm going to ask them some questions about the kinds of apples that they like so this is another example of sending them down a different path but in this case I'm using it within the questionnaire itself not in the survey flow and there's there's some differences of why you would do that that's in that other webinar but this is how you would do it within the survey itself is you, you use the display logic function to say if fruit group is equal to and when you when you start that um, display logic it'll ask you are you display are you using logic from a question or are you using display logic from something else the, the question is the default but if you click the uh, there's a little arrow button if you click that button it'll give you the option to choose embedded data as um, as the driver for your logic in your display group So in quotas, um, you can use your display logic to, um, to drive your quotas. So in this case, um, going back to where we've set our two categories for teenagers and young adults, I've now pulled that into um, a quota setup where I've said, um, I want to set my, my quota where my embedded data age category is equal to teenager. I want, I want 25 teens in my study and I want 25 young adults. So I've set my quotas up such that once I've reached that quota, then the um, the current current survey will end, and and I've likely set up a um, an, an end of survey email message there that says I'm I'm sorry, if, you know, thank you for your interest in the in the study, but I've reached the quota of the number of people that I need for this particular arm. Um, so it's it's the kind of the same idea as you know, there's a drop down box for embedded data. You choose that you're going to drive your quota from your embedded data, and then you set this to be um, whatever you want it to be. Now keep in mind when you're doing these embedded data settings, this is just a blank box. It's relying on you to know what you set your um, field name and what you set your value to be. So if you can't remember that, 
either write it down or you'll you'll just kind of flip back and forth between the quota and the um, and the survey flow view so you can get these names right because it will break your logic if you've gotten this wrong if, if this said age category is equal to teenagers that it would break it because the, the actual value is teenager um, so you want to be really careful that you're you're naming that you're put, inputting the right things into these boxes that match what you set in embedded data Email triggers, this is another um, function under the options menu of your survey. Um, this sends out an email based on criteria that you, that you have set up. So in this particular scenario, I'm, I'm back to my fruit groups again, um, and I'm going to send an email as soon as a person completes the survey, um, I'm going to send um, a, a separate email to my apple eaters group. Maybe I'm going to send them to a website, maybe I'm going to send them to another survey, um, but something I'm going to do, I'm going to trigger an email as soon as I have a completed survey from somebody that has been um, bucketed into the apple eaters group. So maybe I would send them two different emails. I would send an email to um, my control group. I would send an email to my experiment group. Uh, and I can do that through my email triggers by, by embedded data. Contact list triggers are similar to email triggers, although instead of sending an email to the participants, the contact list trigger is creating a new contact list based on information um, from a survey. And this, this is a, a live example of something that I used. Um, I used this function for. We had a set of surveys that we sent out to our faculty asking them about their areas of research expertise. So the first survey that went out said, um, you know, here's a list of all the topics that um, that you could use as a research area of expertise. And then we sent them a follow-up survey that said, okay, these are the topics that you told us um, that were your research areas, and now we want you to, to tell us, you know, how closely do you think that these topics fit you? And we asked them some follow-up questions. So what I did was, because this was kind of a rolling survey, folks would fill it out at different times, was I set up waves of um, respondents where I could go in and, and email them back on a batch basis. So I would, every Friday I would go in and I would look at who's responded this week. That would be my next wave that I would work on. I would send those surveys out. Once I did that, I would send, I would set this contact list trigger to be, whoops, I think it's too fast. I would set this contact list trigger back to be um, the next wave. So I've, I've done follow-up wave one. Now I'm going to go in and do follow-up wave two. Um, and I would create a new contact list for those folks. And then at the end of that week, then I would do, I would process that wave. And what I've done, so I've passed all this information from the survey. I've passed in their first name, their last name, their email, and then I'm, I'm passing in all of this embedded data. And in this case, these embedded data, these are the, the answers from the questions from survey one. So th those survey answers are becoming embedded data for my survey too. Right, that may sound a little confusing, but um, this data right now is becoming embedded data in my contact list for survey two. So I've set that up, and then now when this new contact list is created, this is the embedded data for a, an individual that has been pulled in from survey one. So their education topics are listed here, then they had a um, a follow-up question where they could add some specificity to, to those topics, and then they had human sciences topics, and they had human sciences specificity. So again, going back to William's earlier question is, you, you have to leave room for all of your options, but in this case, the person didn't answer any human sciences um, questions, so those are just blank. So they're, they're, there's the line breaks and the data that's it's just in there as a null, um, and there's really no way to get around that. Um, so then now in survey two, when, I, when I'm designing survey two, I'm using this, I've, I'm piping this information from my embedded data uh, into the survey question. So I'm, I'm telling them the same thing with the school districts example. I'm saying these are the um, research areas of expertise that you had told us in the first survey. Um, now we're going to ask you some questions about, um, about those. So that's where that appears in the survey. And this, this is the, um, the syntax of how Qualtrics calls for embedded data. Um, but this, this was all taken care of through the, 
the survey setup that I did. So I'm not actually typing in any of this code. It's just I've, I've pointed it to which fields I want. It's put it into the contact list in the format that it understands. And then I'm just calling it back. I'm saying I want embedded data from the contact list. And this is where I want it from. And, and it's plugging in all of this um, code on its own. So another cool thing to remember about embedded data is whatever you set your embedded data to be, that can become part of your data set. Um, so this is a pretty powerful way to do some, um, some pre-processing of your data before it, it gets even to analysis. So in, in my earlier example where I had um, fruit groups where I had broken folks out into um, apple eaters or orange eaters or, or both categories, um, I can view that in my data and analysis but then when I export my data, I'm also seeing that as a column. I'm seeing that in my data set. So if you want to add some extra data into your data set, and maybe you're not even going to use that embedded data for anything, like the use case examples that we've shown, where you're not going to put it in branch logic, you're not going to put it in a contact list, but maybe you're just going to use it as an extra variable. So you can have Qualtrics do some of the some of the lifting for you of putting folks into groups, or you know, like the previous example of you know, teenagers, of young adults. If you need to put um, participants into strata of some kind, you can do that using embedded data, even though you're not piping it anywhere, you're not doing anything with it other than using it as a variable. So that's that's another option um, of how you can use embedded data. That's all I've got on embedded data, but we have time. I can, I can stay here um, online if folks have questions. Um, I know there's a note there that some of the print was pretty small on my screenshots, um, but you can go full screen on that. And I also uploaded a copy of the PDF of these slides um, to the to the chat window or to the file window so you could download those and I will also send them out to all the people that were on the call today um, so you will get a copy of the PDF of the slides so you can you can blow those up if you need to see some of those screenshots a little bit closer and of course we'll also send out the recording and so if you need to go back and look at some specific things that Heather was talking about, you can sure do that. Yes. So absolutely. any questions? Yeah, so any questions? So Heather, you have already scheduled your next Qualtrics Corner. What's the topic going to be? The next topic is going to be Survey Flow Part 2. We had talked about survey flow um, back earlier in the spring, and it's too big of a topic to, to put in one 30-minute webinar, so I divided it in half. Um, I will, any, everybody that was in my Qualtrics Corner interest uh, list will get an, an email about that announcing it. And if you need a refresher, that, that link to survey flow part one is, in, is on our website under the uh, professional development archive. You can go take a look at that. And I'll probably do a quick little run through of that um, at the beginning of that webinar. But I really want to dive in and talk to um, talk about part two because survey flow is, is a pretty interesting function of Qualtrics. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Leah is typing. Oh, when is that webinar? Let me look. That would the Qualtrics corners are generally the first Monday of the month. Um, we had to, to bump this one in September because of Labor Day being last week. Um, so the next webinar will be October second, Monday, October second, and they're typically at 11 a.m. And again, we had, we had to bump that one, this one this afternoon because I had a, a meeting this morning. But typically second or first Monday of the month, uh, 11 a.m. for Qualtrics corner. Uh, 11:30. 11.30, yes, sorry. Yeah, well, what we want people to do is, uh, you know, start eating their lunch and, and sort of have a brown bag, but a virtual brown bag. Absolutely. All right, well, we'll get all this information sent out to everyone, and thank you so much for coming, and uh, we'll see you next month. Yep, and if you have follow-up questions that, that you didn't quite think of right now, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, and I will I will get at those.